Now, as we talk about the gospel and what it means um, to understand the gospel and, of course, respond to it, we have to start from the beginning. Turn over to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. You see, man has a desire that's God-given for him to come to God. We see that here in our parable as these two men go to the temple to pray. But notice that from the beginning, things were set and they were made perfect by God in Genesis chapter 1. So turn there, Genesis chapter 1, and notice in verse 27, things were good from the beginning. Things were right. Things were perfect. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so God created mankind in his own image is the idea. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, people were, at that point in time, the way they were supposed to be. They were perfected, if you will. There was no fault in them. They were the most perfect people who've ever lived up until this point in time. Adam and Eve had a body, they had a soul, and they had a spirit. They were created in the image of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is a trichotomy. Man is created as a trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit. But remember what happens. Though we were created that way and things were supposed to be that way, then something happens. Everything gets messed up. Notice Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. God has given them instruction, helping them to understand what their responsibility is in the Garden of Eden. And they're told they can do basically whatever they want. They can eat of any tree in the garden except for one specific tree. They want to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice Genesis 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, notice this. God gave them a responsibility to care for the garden. He gave them freedom to do really whatever they wanted, and he just gives them one rule. That's it. One thing, he says, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. And there's a consequence attached to it. In the day, the idea is, in the moment that you eat of it, things will change. He says, in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now, we know that what's going to happen is Adam and Eve are going to eat of the fruit they were told not to eat of. And what happens? They begin to die, and eventually they will die. But they don't die immediately, at least they don't die immediately in a physical sense. But they do, in fact, die. In Genesis chapter 2, the idea is God is saying, in the day that you eat of it, dying you will die. Meaning this, you will begin to die physically, but you will die spiritually. And that's what happens. Remember, we were created in a right way. We were created perfect by God, body, soul, and spirit. We were created in the image of God. Our body, of course, we see. It's right there in front of us. We see each other's body. Our soul, we might grow to know, meaning we know each other's personality. That's who we are, our id, if you will. Our spirit, though, is something different. Our spirit is not our body. Our spirit is not our soul. It's different. This is why the Bible says, in Hebrews chapter 4, that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide or discern between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Our soul and our spirit are not the same. Our soul, again, is our personality. It's what we say is who we are. But it's really not completely everything we are. Our spirit is that part of us that God created that connects with Him. And so when we are born physically, we are born physically, body and soul. But our spirit is dead. And the reason why we're born dead, if you will, is because of Adam and Eve's sin. Because in the day that they ate of the fruit, they died spiritually. And so now we are walking around, if you will, outside of Christ as a dichotomy, just two parts rather than three parts. We're walking around less than we've been intended to be. This is why the Bible tells us if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, and the old things, they passed away. Behold, all things become new, brand new. And what that means for us is this. Up until the moment that we accept Jesus Christ, up until the moment that we know him personally, 
up until that moment that we've been converted, when we've been changed, when we begin to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, up until that moment, we're a dichotomy. We're walking around body and soul, longing, knowing there's something missing, knowing that there's something that must be out there, something better than what we have. You can't fill that longing, that desire with drugs or alcohol. You can't fill it with sex. You can't fill it with success. You can't fill it with money. You can't fill it with religion. You can't fill that longing, that need that there's something else with simply doing good or going to church or being a good Christian, so to speak. It's a longing that we have to have our spirit made alive so that we can function as God has called us to. This is, again, why the Scripture says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things, they passed away. Behold, all things become new. It's a metamorphosis. We've changed. We've gone literally from, from crawling around like a caterpillar to coming to Christ and now being made alive, and now we're a butterfly. You guys say, I don't want to be a butterfly. But imagine being a bottom feeder, being one that's just crawling around in the dirt when all along you've been intended to soar. You've been made to fly. That's why there is a longing inside of our heart, outside of Christ, for something more. Blaise Pascal put it this way, and the heart of every man is created a God-shaped void. There's a hole. There's a hole that's there. And that hole can only be filled by God. Now, if we have a hard time understanding this idea that we are a trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit, look at the rest of creation. Look at those that are sentient, beings that are alive, animals. Animals are not a trichotomy. Animals are a dichotomy. They have a body. We see that. They have a soul. We know that, especially if you're a pet lover. You know that animals have a soul. Dogs, cats, they have a personality. Dogs, sometimes their personalities are good. Sometimes their personalities are bad. Cats, pretty much are always bad. Okay? They have a personality but they do not have a spirit. There is no spirit. There is no part of them that communicates to God. There's not a part of them that has spiritual unction, spiritual drive. They don't have the spirit. They don't have the equipment. We were born with that spirit being dead because of Adam and Eve's sin, and God wants to cause us to be born again, which means our spirit is made alive. And now we function the way God intended us to, body, soul, and spirit. Now, God gives that command in Genesis 2, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, man and woman do eat of that fruit. And what happens? Genesis 3. Notice Genesis 3, verse 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. We know that the woman was deceived she listens to the voice of the serpent. She struggles. And of course, she eats. Adam was not deceived. Perhaps seeing his wife in a fallen state couldn't bear to see her be that way by herself. Wherever it is, he walks away from God. He rebels and willfully chooses to eat. And because he does, they find themselves in a condition called a fallen state. Genesis 3 verse 6 says, She took of its fruit and she ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Verse 7, notice this. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Notice this. When they sin, when they fail, when they do the thing that God told them not to do, just one chapter earlier, when they do that, knowing that what God said was right, knowing that what they did was wrong, notice what happens. As soon as that happens, shame comes. An understanding of their condition, and then also an effort to try to cover their nakedness. An effort to try to deal with the problem of their sin. And from this point forward, right here in Genesis 3, verse 6, we see religion has come into the world. That desire to somehow cover our sin, the desire to deal with the problem of our sin, the desire to want to try to make things right. And that's what religion is. Religion is man's effort to set things right. The problem is it doesn't work. Just like them, we sin, and when we sin, we sense there's something wrong. Even before Christ, 
there's a sense that somehow that thing was not right. Oftentimes, people wrestle with that and they have guilt and they have a burden, a weight that's upon them. But you can't set those things right. You can't make things right. You can't make yourself clean. It's impossible to do so. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 22, let me read it to you. It says this, For though you wash yourself and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. That's important for us to understand because this is true for every person in this room. All of us have experienced it. Every one of us has sinned. And when we sin, we might try to clean ourselves up. We might try to clean up our act. We might try to fix things, but we can't. The problem is, is that our dirty hands can't cause anything in our body to be clean. As we're washing ourselves, we're making ourselves more dirty. We can't, as an unclean thing, make an unclean thing clean. It's not possible. Our sin is marked before us, meaning God sees that sin. It's like a permanent marker. It can't come off. There's nothing we can do about it. God is the only solution that there is. Notice verse 9 in our text in Luke 18, verse 9. Notice what it says. It's the reason for this parable being given. Luke 18, verse 9, it says, Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves. Notice this again. He spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves. That's religion. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. That's religion. And they despised others. Sometimes what happens is when people are religious and they think so much of themselves and they're focused on themselves, they begin to think, well, at least I'm better than the people around me. And they begin to despise other people. That's religion. What we need to understand is this. Religion cannot save. Only Jesus saves. Only Jesus. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, tells us this. And they heard that as Adam and Eve, in their fallen state, with those fig leaves sewed up out themselves, it says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, Then the Lord God called to Adam, and he said to him, Where are you? And that's the thing we need to remember. Every person in this room, you need to remember, this is a question not just for Adam and Eve, it's a question for us. Where are you? Where are you at? Are you close to God this morning? Are you far? Do you think that you're too good, that you don't need forgiveness. You think you've measured up. Or do you feel like you're so bad you don't belong in this place at all? Are you religious? Or are you enjoying the fact that you have a relationship with God? Of course, when, when God asks them, where are you? He's not wondering, where are you? As if he can't see them hiding behind the bush. He sees where they are physically. He's not asking a question ever because he doesn't know the answer. He's asking the question because he wants to make us think. Where are you? Where are you this morning? That's a good question. Notice verse 10 in our text, Luke 18, verse 10. Jesus begins the parable and says, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. There are two things we need to know when we come to God. The first is this. It's found in verses 11 through 12. No one is so good that they don't need forgiveness. The second is found in verse 13. No one is so bad that they can't be forgiven. Notice the first, verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. The idea is while he is praying to God, he's actually acknowledging that this other man's in the room. He's looking, he's noticing. He sees him. He's already despised him. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, before we go on, we have to understand who the Pharisees are. The Pharisees weren't always bad. The Pharisees were a group of people who, back during a time when, when many Jews were walking away from God and they were living like the world, they were becoming just like the world around them, they were speaking the world's language, literally, but they were dressing like them, they were acting like them, they had completely assumed the world's lifestyle. A group of people rose up saying, we long for God, we have a desire for the things that are right. And so we need to be separate from the world. Now, the Bible says that we're called out to be separate, 
That's a wonderful thing, that we're called out to be separate from the world around us. We are not to sound like the world around us. We're not supposed to be like them. We're not supposed to have the same lifestyle. We're supposed to stand out. That's what the church is, those who have been called out to be separate. So these were those that had a zeal for God. They had a longing for the things that were righteous. And so they said, we need to be separate because we can't become like the world around us. Pharisee is a word that means separate. That's all it means. Those who are separate. And so back then, with that longing, with that desire, it started off with a good heart saying, we want to be separate from the world. But that wasn't enough. So it, was, it wasn't enough for them to simply be separate from the world and live with the world. They decided to move away. And so they moved away from the cities. And they had their own community. And they weren't involved in other people's life. You know, they weren't having an impact on those around them. They were simply focused on themselves. And focused on themselves, they convinced themselves they were better than everybody else. They convinced themselves, having been made separate, that they were now the standard that other people should live by. And they didn't just seek to keep the law, but they began to add to the law. So the Pharisees were those who were self-righteous. They had convinced themselves, not only were they okay with God, they were right up there next to God. They were good. Jesus is speaking to them. And notice what he says in Matthew 15, verse 7. Matthew 15, verse 7. It's interesting how Jesus speaks to those who those in the world thought were really righteous. It's interesting how he speaks to those who were the multitude and how he has grace and compassion on them in the midst of their sin. He speaks truth, the truth they need to hear to those who were low, to those who were hurting, to those who felt beat up by their own choices or the choices of others. It's gracious words that they hear constantly. To those who were self-righteous, those who were prideful, they get corrected. They get rebuked. Jesus speaks to them with truth. Matthew 15, verse 7, Jesus is speaking and he says, hypocrites. Notice, hypocrites. He starts off with this, this word, strong word. The word means actor, one who wears a mask, one who's pretending to be something they're not. Now listen, we all fail. We all fail. We all set a standard right here and we try to reach that standard and we fail to reach it. That does not make you a hypocrite. What makes you a hypocrite is when you set a standard and you do not reach that standard and you want to pretend like you have, like you have reached that standard. That makes you an actor. Failing, sinning doesn't make you a hypocrite. It makes you human. Being a hypocrite is being a phony. And so he's saying to them, hypocrites, you're hypocrites. These were the leaders of Israel. These were the ones that were supposed to be the example to the people. These were those who were teaching the people. And he says, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Notice that. Wow. Those are strong words. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. There's an important thing for us to remember. We could sometimes think we're right with God. We could sometimes think we're okay with God when we're not okay with God. The Pharisees thought they were okay with God, and they're being called hypocrites. Somebody once said, Christians don't lie. They just sing lies during worship at church. Lies like, you have my whole heart, really. You have my whole life. Lord, I love you. Well, if he's Lord, then we should do what he says. If we've given him our whole heart, we don't take it back. If we love Him, it ought to show. Sometimes going to church, being in church, hearing the truth and not responding to it can be the biggest inoculation to truth because we can think we're okay because we're sitting in the seat. We can think we're okay because we know where the passage is. We can think we're okay because we know the songs by heart. We can think we're okay because we can be moved in our soul and stand and raise our hands. We can think we're okay for lots of different reasons when we might not be okay. The Pharisees were not okay with God. Everything on the outside looked okay, but inside, Jesus said, you're like dead men's bones. And so he said, you worship me with your lips, but your heart, it's far from me. You see, they had a problem. What's the problem with them? There are three things. Verse 11, self-deception. There was self-deception there. They had a big issue. 
Notice, it says, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner, he says. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. Or even like this tax collector. Now, he's self-deceived, and here's why. Let me read it to you. In James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. The point is this. The law is the standard outside of Christ. The law is. And so if we say we're okay and we can come to God on our own merit, then we have to keep the law. But he says right here, notice, he who said, thou shalt not commit adultery, also said, thou shalt not murder. But the idea is this, he that said, thou shalt not commit adultery, you're saying, I didn't do that. All right. He that says, I did not commit adultery, right? Or God said that, you know, don't commit adultery. I didn't do it. Don't murder. I didn't do that. He also said, thou shalt not steal. Uh, I don't think I've ever stolen. All right. He also says, Obey the law of the land. Don't speak. Uh, what does that mean? I mean, if I break the law by speeding, I'm guilty of murder, adultery, of thievery. If I break the law in any way, I'm guilty of the whole law. I've broken the law. We make distinctions. Now, it is true that sin has different consequences. But sin is sin is sin. Now, some sins, of course, are physical sins, and they carry a greater consequence than the sin of your heart or your mind. That makes sense. For example, you lust. There's a consequence to that. There's a big difference between you lusting, which is adultery, and you physically being with someone that's not your spouse. There's a physical consequence Jesus says, you have hatred in your heart towards someone, you're angry with them without a cause, and you've committed murder. There's a big difference between being angry with someone without a cause and killing them. The point is this, though, both are sin. Both break the law. And for God, it's important for us to understand this, sin is sin is sin is sin. In this case, any sin causes you to be guilty of the law. Every sin put Jesus on the cross. But here's the good news. Any sin can be forgiven. But we have to recognize that it's sin. This man is saying, look, I'm not like other men. I haven't done these things. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a tax collector. He could go on and say, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a thief. I'm not all these different things. But what is he? What is he doing? Because the thing that he does makes him a transgressor of the law, just like the things that we do make us a transgressor of the law. Let me put it this way. Think of your life like a house. Your life is like a house. And you say, I want to secure the house. I want to make it absolutely secure so that no one can come in, that nothing can come in that's not supposed to be in. And let's say outside is the enemy. And the enemy, of course, he's not, not bound by physical things. Right? He's a spirit. The enemy wants to come in. And you say, okay, I've closed the door. I've locked it. I've closed the windows and I've locked it. I even kind of you know, put something in the way of the fireplace so nothing can come down through the fireplace. I've closed everything off, even the dryer vent. I thought through that, and I've closed that off. But if you've left a mail slot in the door unprotected, the entire house is vulnerable. Look, we have to make sure every single part is dealt with if we're going to say that we have been justified by the law. Or... We just give the keys to Jesus and say, it's your house. He'll make the house secure. Unless the Lord guards the city, they labor in vain to watch it. God is the one that can make us safe. God is the one that can make us secure. This man is self-deceived. He thinks he's okay, but he's not. He thinks he's innocent. He is focused on what he does not do. God is not so concerned about what you do not do. You can have a whole list of the things you haven't done. But what have you done? How have you sinned? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's self-deceived. Secondly, you see self-reliance. That's also his problem. Notice verse 12. Verse 12, he says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, here's kind of an interesting prayer. 
It's always a concern, I think, when people are informing God of something. We don't come to God to inform Him and tell Him. As if God didn't know that already. Just so you know, God, I, I, I fast twice. Twice a week. Oh, that just changes everything, right? God's like, wow, you impress me. I've never been impressed for thousands of years. No one has impressed me, but that impresses me. You fast twice a week, and you give tithes of all you have, something you're supposed to be doing anyway. It's not impressive. But he's impressed because he has self-reliance. He's focused on himself. Isaiah 64, verse 6 says, but we are all like an unclean thing. So every one of us, who we are outside of Christ, we are unclean. We're an unclean thing. Then it goes on to say, and all our righteousness is like filthy rags. So we're unclean, everything we do is unclean, any good we do is unclean. So well, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I think it would make sense if we describe it this way. If you had a relationship with someone, maybe it's a best friend, maybe it's you know, a boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe it's a husband or wife, whatever the relationship might be. If you have a relationship with someone and the person does something to you, to wrong you, to hurt you, and it's something that's big, they do something to wrong you or hurt you, and they won't take responsibility for it. They won't say they're sorry. They won't admit they're wrong. But they bring you a gift. How do you feel about that gift? How do you feel if, if somebody who won't take responsibility for the way that they've hurt you, the way they've caused damage, they won't make it right, they won't address that issue, but instead they go, hey, here you go, have this. It doesn't matter what that thing is. It doesn't matter if it's really, really expensive. It doesn't matter if it's really, really tasty. They bring to you, you know, cheesecake. They bring to you chocolate. They bring to you flowers. They bring to you whatever the thing they bring you, but they're not taking responsibility for their sin. They're not admitting they were wrong. They're not repentant. Are you blessed? I don't think you are. I think you understand intrinsically that if a person wrongs you, and they do something to hurt you, and they come to you with a gift without taking responsibility, without repenting, they're trying to cover it up. They're trying to just gloss it over. They're trying to pull one over on you. They're trying to pay you off. They're trying to buy you. And you won't receive that. That food, if you eat it, it won't taste right. Those flowers just aren't that pretty anymore. A thing that's valuable, it might as well be glass. Because they haven't taken responsibility for the wrong. They haven't made wrong things right. That's why the word says that we are an unclean thing and our righteousness is like filthy rags. When we try to work our way into heaven, when we try to work our way into the grace of God, what we are saying is that we believe we can do better than the wrong that we did. And we can't. Anything that we give is going to be less than what's required. And that is this, perfection. We can't do enough good to outdo the bad that we've done. It's not possible. So this man has an issue. Self-deception, but also self-reliance. He's focused on his own works. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. It doesn't matter at all if he's not forgiven. You put them both together, and what do you have? Notice verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. What do you notice? This guy has an eye problem. Self-absorption. He is self-absorbed. Even to the point that it begins with these words, he prayed thus with himself. How weird is that? He's going to the temple to pray, and he's not even talking to God. He's talking to himself. Think about that. And then it's I, 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 I. Where does that come from? I'll tell you where it comes from. Isaiah 14, turn there with me. Isaiah 14. We have to understand that we all are born focused on ourselves. We're born focused on I, 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 I. No one has to teach us how to say mine, 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 mine as a small child. No one has to teach us how to be selfish. Our heart naturally beats for ourselves. We think about ourselves all the time. We'd like to talk about ourselves. 
Some people think about themselves and they talk about themselves and then they get tired of that for the moment. And so they say to someone else, they say, well, enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? So they're focused on themselves. I, 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 I. You say, I'm not focused on myself. Oh, yeah. Watch when there's a picture of a whole group of people and you're in it. Who do you look at? You. You want to see if you look good. And if you look good, everybody else could look like garbage. But if you look good, let's frame that one. Keep it. That's a great picture because you're focused on yourself. I. It's human nature. It's how we are. We're born that way. Isaiah 14, verse 12, tells us where this comes from. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. You say, well, who's that? Lucifer. Beautiful name. It means light. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Do you see that Satan himself has an eye problem? That's where it comes from. It goes on in verse 15, and it says, Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you, that is, those who see you, Satan, will gaze at you and consider you, meaning they'll be in awe and wonder as they see you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? I mean, is this the one that caused all the havoc? Is this the one that caused so much hurt? Is this the one that imprisoned so many people in sin and wouldn't let them go? Is this the one? Now, some have thought that perhaps what the writer means is this, that when Satan is there before everyone else at the judgment, when they see him, that they'll be in awe and wonder, think, is this it? This is it? Like, I mean, here it is. Like, he's a wimpy thing, you know, wearing a pocket protector. Is this it? That's it? This weakling is it? Like that. I don't think so. Ezekiel tells us who he was and tells us how beautiful he was. I think it's more like, is this the one? Meaning, he's beautiful. He looks perfect. He looks good. Wouldn't it make sense for the one that's a deceiver to come looking like everything you've desired? Rather than the one who's a deceiver looking all horrible, and horrific and scary. All I know is this, that many thought he was something he wasn't. He thought he was something he wasn't. And those who are like the Pharisees come before God and they think they're something that they're not. They think they're good. And they're not good. When we think that way, we become like Satan. Religion is all about the things that man does for God whereas relationship is all about the things that God has done for us. But if we have a high-minded view of ourselves, we'll be focused on our works, not on His. No one is so good that they don't need forgiveness. We need to understand that this morning. Some of you have a background in church. Some of you have a background in church and you've gone to church your whole life. You've been faithful in whatever that call was. You've been faithful in whatever your religion taught you. Some of you were so good, you might have even stood out among those who were your age. Some of you were so good and stood out that other people have said that you're the person who's an example. You're the person who, who they want their kids to be like. And listen, all that means is you might have been better than other people around you. That doesn't mean that you're good. That doesn't mean that you're worthy. That doesn't mean that you're acceptable before a holy and living God. That'd be like saying... We're going to have a jumping contest. And we have a group of people in this room, and, and one person jumps maybe two inches off the ground. They got, you know, attachment to gravity. Somebody else comes along. They're pretty athletic. You know, they jump 20 inches off the ground. Someone else comes along, and, and they're really athletic. They're a professional athlete, and they have a 44-inch vertical. And they jump 44 inches off the ground. Impressive. We can all say that the person that had the 44-inch vertical jumped higher than anybody else. That's wonderful. We can even be a little bit in awe and wonder at how high they can jump. In fact, they can dunk a basketball. 
but it doesn't mean anything if we understand that the goal wasn't who jumps the highest. The goal was which one of you can fly. Jumping 44 inches is not impressive if you're having a jumping contest with Superman. Listen, the standard is holiness. The standard is righteousness. The standard is truly being good. And religion cannot help anyone be acceptable before a holy and living God. We can do all the things that religion tells us to do. We can be a religious person. We can do good. We can be worthy in our own mind, even in the eyes of other people. And it doesn't mean that we're worthy before God. It doesn't mean that we're accepted before Him on our own merit. We need Jesus. Amen? We need Him. And that means we need something more that religion can give. We need a relationship with Jesus Christ. Some of you this morning, you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. You haven't met Him yet. You know religion. You know about God. You know a lot about God. You can share a lot about God. You can do good things for God. But it doesn't mean you know God. We have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the sad reality is this. Many people think they're okay with God before they're okay with God. And listen, because of religion. Religion is probably the number one thing that convinces people they're okay with God when they're not okay with God. And the reason why it's attractive to us is we can point on the outward. We can say, this is why I know I'm okay with God. Listen, if you can point to the outward and say, this is why I know I'm okay with God, then you have a problem because the only reason why you're okay with God is an inside thing. And that's faith. I believe in Jesus Christ unto salvation. I'm saved by grace through faith. His work, all His outside work, my inward faith, that's what saves me. When I say yes to Jesus Christ, then He comes in. And He changes everything. So we're going to give you an opportunity before the end of the service to pray to receive Christ, to have a relationship with Him, to no longer walk by your own effort, to no longer walk by religion, but to have a real, genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And that relationship is an entrance into heaven. And so no one is so good that they don't need forgiveness. Every single one of us needs forgiveness, no matter how good we think we are. But secondly, no one is so bad they can't be forgiven. Notice verse 13. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Again, no one is so bad they can't be forgiven. But there are people that are like this. There are people who think they can't be forgiven. There are people who think that they've done something so bad that God, even God, can't deal with that problem. Even God cannot fix it. And so somehow forgiveness isn't for them. Forgiveness might even be for everyone else, they say, but not for them. Not so. Now, the tax collector, we think IRS, you know, April 15th coming right around the corner. That's not fair to, to our friends at the IRS. They're doing a job. Okay? We need to respect that. Tax collectors aren't talking about the IRS. Tax collectors are talking about people in their day that were very low. They were hated. And the reason why they were hated was tax collectors worked for Rome. Rome had dominated Israel. They were subservient to the Romans. And they were taxing them like crazy. And the tax collector was working for their enemy. So they were viewed as a traitor. In addition to that, because they had so much power and the Romans couldn't care less what they did as long as they got their money, these tax collectors would require people to give them more money than they were due. And so they were rip-offs. They were thieves. On top of the fact that they were thieves and they were traitors, they were oppressing people. They were extorting money from them. And so they were considered the lowest of the low. So whenever you hear tax collector, you're not literally talking about people necessarily that are tax collectors all the time, but rather people who are low, people who take advantage of other people, people who use other people. So these here are tax collectors, literally. He was a tax collector, and he had a well-deserved stigma attached to him. Because his job was a low job. His job was a job that caused people a lot of hurt. No one is so bad, they can't be forgiven. Even the tax collector is what Jesus is saying. Now, we don't have that same thought about tax collectors, but we have that thought about other people. We might think that way about thieves. We might think that way about murderers. We might think that way about rapists. We might think that way about child molesters. But here's the reality. No one is so bad that they can't be forgiven. Is that true? 
No one is so bad that they can't be forgiven. Listen, God is so good that he can forgive anything. You say, but what about this? What about that? Bad. What about this? What about that? Or I heard a story about this. Or I read this thing. Bad. All bad. There's all sorts of things that you can read. I'm not going to tell you all the things in the news. There's all sorts of negative things that you can read in the news. All sorts of ways that people defy themselves. Horrible things that people do to each other. You can read about it every single day. All of it bad. All of it horrible. All of it wicked. And listen, God is so good, he's better than those things. He's better than those bad things. You say, well, that seems like that lessens how bad those things are. No, it doesn't. Those things might be so bad that it's this heavy, huge, massive weight. You have a God in heaven who's so good, he can forgive all of those things. Why does that matter? Because you cannot out his goodness. You can't. I can't. So it doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter what sin we've committed. We come to God honestly. We come to him humbly and we admit our sin, and he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't matter what we've done. And it's so important because sometimes people can get hung up on their sin. They can focus on their sin and think that somehow they can't come. Somehow they've been so bad that they won't be accepted. They begin to project their views about themselves on God, that somehow God is now out to get them. God is angry with them. Not so. God's longing for the sinner to come. He's longing for you to come and say, I've done wrong. I repent. Forgive me. Think about this. God created every single person in this room. He created every single person who would ever hear this message. God created every single one. And there is nothing, nothing that you can do that he won't say to you, I can fix it. I can heal you. I can forgive you. Now, it doesn't mean there won't be consequences to your sin. There are consequences to sin, and there should be consequences to sin. You commit physical sin, whether that's murder, whether that's rape, whether that's child molestation, whatever that might be, there are physical consequences to sin. But it doesn't mean the person cannot be forgiven. And what that means is, in heaven, you're going to be surprised at who people who are there and who's not. Because in heaven, you're going to see people there that have done all sorts of horrible things. Horrible things. And might even have to pay for it with their life. But in heaven, what you're going to see are not good people. They're not worthy people. In heaven, you're going to see saved people. You're going to see forgiven people. You're going to see people that God has demonstrated his love for. And he has given them great mercy. And he's made them a new creation. And that means you qualify. Because it doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. God can forgive you. Amen? He can forgive you. No one is so bad that they can't be forgiven. No sin so bad that it can't be forgiven. What's the issue here? We see at the beginning, self-doubt. Notice verse 13. It says, and the tax collector standing afar off. Interesting. Stands afar off. He doesn't want to come close. I get it. I understand it. When we do something bad, when we make a mistake, we kind of want to isolate ourselves. We don't want to get too close. Why is he doing that? I think he's keeping his distance because in his mind, he's thinking that God's angry with him, that he doesn't belong there, that he doesn't fit. That's a mistake. Turn it over to Luke chapter 7. I want to point out something to you. Luke chapter 7 gives us a fantastic story, a wonderful story about a person who was a sinner who comes to Jesus. Luke chapter 7. We find it in verse 36 and following as Jesus is at the house of a Pharisee. Somebody asked him over for dinner. Jesus came and he spent time with them. That was a very intimate thing. And as you're turning there, let me tell you this. For them, their dinner table was very different than ours. We, we have these dinner tables that, that, that they sit pretty much the same. Most of them are the same height and we sit at chairs around them. Or now you have those, those tables that are higher and you have stools all the way around. But we sit and we face each other. And, you know, half of our body is exposed to the other person. And we have our meal. For them, it wasn't like that. Their body was hidden from each other as they laid down on a table that was just a few inches off the ground. And as they laid down, their head was, was near the table. And all of them, with their head near the table, were close enough to be able to eat the food and just kind of shovel it into their mouth. Or they'd reach over, not being able to see, and they would eat. And they would just talk, but they're not eye to eye with each other. They're just talking. And here's what that does. When you're talking like that, you're forced to listen 
carefully. You can't see each other. You're seeing you know, the back of the person's head in front of you and vice versa. Everyone else all the way around the circle. This is why when Jesus says the one that dips, after I dip, that's the one who's going to betray me. This is how they didn't know who it was because they couldn't see. Jesus reached and dipped. And of course, Judas reached and dipped. And no one was the wiser except the Lord. Well, this was the idea as they're gathered around this table and there is Jesus at the table where everyone else, they're talking and they're eating, they're having a great time. And notice what happens in Luke 7, verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Verse 38. And she stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. The idea is this. She was a sexual sinner. She was a person who was known in the area, but Jesus is new to the area. If this man was a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is who is touching him, who is being intimate. Notice something. She's a sinner. We know that for sure. She's a sinner, but notice right there in verse 38, it says she stood. That means that she came first standing. She was standing. She was available. She was there, but it's not intimate. It's not close. Notice as it goes on, it says, and at his feet, she was behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears, meaning this. The only way that's going to happen is for her to get lower. Now she's kneeling. At a minimum, she's kneeling. It says, and wipe them with the hair of her head. She'd have to be bowing to do that. And then she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil, which means she had to go down to the ground. She's prostrate before him. She's lying. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, if he were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is who was touching him. Listen. Because Jesus is more than a prophet, not only did he know who was touching him, he knew the condition of her heart. He knew that she came distant, that she came standing afar off, as it were. And then she was kneeling, and then she was bowing, and then she was lying before him. Her heart was right. This man here is standing afar off. He doesn't have to wait. He could go to kneeling immediately. He could go before the Lord with confidence because God is so good, he can forgive sin. The same thing is true for you this morning. You don't have to stand afar off. You don't have to think that somehow you have to work your way into a place where you could ask for forgiveness. You don't have to work your way into God's good graces. He offers his grace to you freely. You just simply come. And as you come and you come honestly, he accepts you. He knows your heart. He knows where you're at. And he'll come to you. And so this guy has self-doubt. That's a problem. He also has self-hate. That's common. Notice verse 13 again. It says that he would not so much as raise his eyes to the heavens, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Anytime we beat ourselves up about our sin, there's a problem. The problem is for us, we're surprised about our sin. We get shocked about our sin, meaning when we do something, we might say to ourselves, I can't believe I did that. Why? You're a sinner. Or you're shocked. <laughs> I can't believe I went this far. How did I end up here? God's not shocked. He's not surprised. He knew how bad you were when he created you. He knew how bad you were from the very beginning. He always knows exactly how bad we were. And he forgave us on the cross at Calvary for our sins, past, present, and future. He died for every single one. And so we come to him and we say, God, take my life. He takes your life. You say, God, forgive me of my sins. He forgives you of every single sin. Every single thing, thing you've ever done, it's gone. And now you're made a new creation. So he's not surprised by the things that we've done. He's not shocked, but this guy is. And he beats himself up for it. Listen, in John 19, verse 30, Jesus says a phrase. It's the seventh phrase that he says. There's seven sayings that Jesus says on the cross at Calvary. But this seventh one is the most profound. The seventh one is the one that's most important. Notice what he says in John 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He says it's finished. 
It's a financial term. What it means is paid in full. The debt is paid. Notice again what it says. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Listen, because this is a really important thing for us as Christians to remember. When we beat ourselves up about our sin, what we are saying is that Jesus' death on the cross was not enough. What needs to happen is his death and me beating myself up. His death and my works. His death and my fervent apology. His death and. That's not so. When he said it is finished, he literally meant it is finished. It's done. It's done, which means sometimes when I'm confessing my sin as a believer to the Lord, when I come to him, I'm confessing things like this. God, forgive me that I said that. Forgive me that I did that. Forgive me that I don't feel too bad about what I've done. Because there's sometimes that I don't feel that bad about something I've done, but I know it's wrong. Am I the only one? Has anyone else ever felt that way? Raise your hand if you ever felt that way. You don't feel that bad about what you've done. You guys surprised me. It doesn't surprise God. Whatever we've done, whatever we felt, whatever we said, whatever we thought, we take it before the Lord and we say, God, you paid for it. Forgive me. And he does. His forgiveness is for every single thing you've ever done and everything you'll ever do. When he said it's finished, it was finished. The third thing that's a problem for him is self-focus. Notice again, verse 13. The tax collector standing afar off. That's because of his own view. He would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. I think the Lord's saying, look at me. And then he beat his breast. There's nothing that says that's a good thing for him to do that. This is the good thing he did. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the only good thing he really does. What it means is this. The first man, it's self-deception, self-reliance, self-absorption. The second man, self-doubt, self-hate, and self-focus. Listen, religion is all about self. Relationship is about God. We get our eyes away from ourselves and away from our behavior, away from our circumstances, and we get our eyes on God. Now that's something that God will work with. Religion does not save, but Jesus saves. He's the only one that saves. And I remember the first time I ever heard that. I was being pursued by the Lord. People were sharing with me. I was reading the Bible. I remember hearing Religion does not save. And that was something that was hard for me because I was religious. I was focused on things that I could see, things that I could do. I remember that day that I was by myself reading the Bible, and I was reading through the book of Romans, and I read these passages. I read the passages there that speak about salvation. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's me. I've sinned and I've fallen short of the glory of God. Then I read the wages of sin is death. (laughs) That convicted me like crazy scared me. But then the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we get sinners, Christ died for us. And I thought, while I was sinning and I didn't have any interest in him, while I had never read the Bible, he had already died for me. And then when I got to Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and it said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. When I cried out in that empty church all by myself, I cried out as loud as I could, I believe, hoping it would take. I cried out, I believe. And God came into my life and began to do things. And as he began to do things, I still had doubts. I still struggled. But it's interesting because Romans chapter 10 actually went on to say more. And in verse 11, it says, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. That's a truth I would later discover in the summer of that same year. And then it goes on and it says this, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's interesting because that was one of the verses that was used when I heard the gospel message presented to me the first time in August of 1991. When I heard that, I knew I was saved. I knew I had passed from death into life. I had become a new creation. In verse 14 of our text, it says, I tell you, this man, that is the man who was humble, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Listen, religion is about man trying to get up to God. 
relationship happens because God came down to man. That's the way it's always been. Adam and Eve, in the midst of their sin, as soon as they blew it, tried to sew fig leaves together to cover it, they tried to deal with the problem of their sin, and what happens? They heard the sound of the Lord God walking through the garden. From the very beginning, God came down. He came down, and he says, where are you? I love that about our God, because he does the same thing for you and me. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2 says, In an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Would you stand with me?